This is Dave Tate with a special edition of Table Talk. What I'm going to do today is um, I haven't had the time to devote to answering questions on the Q&A as I should, so I'm going to go through a lot of my Q&A questions and just answer them through uh, this video, see how this goes, see how you guys like it, see how it works. So I have no idea what these questions are going to be. I'm just going to kind of scroll through them and we'll go from there. Um, the first question is asking about um, herniated disc. Um, from their understanding, <laughs> they know that I've had herniated disc problems in the past. What sort of exercises and programs did I follow to enable to keep training? Um, obviously, I'm not a physical therapist, doctor, chiropractor, or whatnot. So the only advice that I can give is what I did for myself, and that's it. You know, so what I did through the disc injuries that I had is um, it, it depended on the severity of, of each one of them and how flat on my back I basically was. So typically I would, I would my main goal was to, to move, to keep moving, to have movement. And if, if something would have happened on a Monday, that would put me on the floor. And why I mean put me on the floor, I'm on the floor, I can't move. I spend most of the day in bed because it's impossible to move without breathing. It feels like somebody kicked you in the ribs. Um, you can't catch your breath. I mean, you can't basically do anything. So I did during that time when I was immobile, I did ice, you know, which is, you know, now people are starting to say that's not the best thing to do. But I question how much pain these people have really been in when they do have an acute injury. Um, that at least helped with the pain as far as the pain management of that. Usually by the second day, I was able to have some type of movement. By that time, I started to work everything that I could around that area without specifically hitting the area. So it would have been, you know, some seated leg curls, uh, ab work, anything that I could that didn't really aggravate the back but still got fluid moving throughout my body. Um, usually by the day after that, I would start with a really, really super high. I called it a, a rack or stripping the rack. It's, it's a pin pull, but I'm keeping the bar against the rack the whole entire time. So I only had maybe a two-inch range of motion because that's all I could go down before the pain would get so bad that I wouldn't be able to come back up or I'd end up on the floor. And I would do 50 to 100 repetitions of that multiple times per day. The goal was to be able to drop one pin or one and a half inches or one inch every day until I could get down to a full range of motion for 50 reps with the bar. Um, so basically the answer to this is I did as much movement as I possibly could after the first, after the, the trauma or the first stage of injury to where it didn't matter on the first day if I did movement or didn't do movement because I was incapable of doing the movement. So at that point in time, it was just trying to keep everything, you know, relaxed and the best I possibly could. And then after that, usually after that first day, it's movement, 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 whatever I could possibly do. Uh, for my lower back, any of the band distraction, any of that kind of stuff for me personally didn't do anything. It was always movement you know, some type of stripping the rack, as I spoke about, uh, really, really low reverse hypers. I would do reverse hypers where it wasn't really a reverse hyper. It was a toe push. I would get up on the machine, put my toes against the plates, and then push the plates for, or forward a couple of inches and then resist them on the way back. So it was more of an eccentric contraction that I was looking at. Um, those things and, and regular reverse hypers when I got to this stage or bent knee reverse hypers, one leg reverse hypers, um, those things helped me more than anything else. Um, once I got through that stage that was more of a, the prehabilitation standpoint was for me personally, I had to keep my obliques, my abdominals, and my lower back as strong as I possibly could. So that was basically living on, you know, some type of good morning movement, reverse hypers, uh, pull down abs, anything that was going to stretch the abs in a standing position was a movement that I lived and died by. Um, hanging leg raises were another one. Um, four, four times a week with that stuff, sometimes even more. Um, 
I can give all kinds of examples, you know, backwards sled dragging. There's a lot of different things that you can do, you know, for the core and for the lower back as well. So that's the answer to that one. Um, this one, it's a novice using wrist wraps um, for benching. It's creating pain in the back of his hands. You know, is it just him or is he simply wrapping incorrectly? Uh, without seeing how you're wrapping, I really don't know. I would do a, um, a site search on our website. On the top toolbar, you'll see it actually says site search. I would search for um, casting wrist wraps or casting or rip wrap casting and look for an article on how to wrap your wrist. My assumption here is you're probably not wrapping them correctly. There will be some pain with any wrap that you put on if you put it on tight enough. Um, but if it's acute pain, then I would be questioning what you're doing. Um, your wrist should be in a neutral position when you are benching. So if it is cocked back too much, um, that could cause some issues as well. But if you're wrapping tight, it's almost impossible, or tight and right, it's almost impossible for that wrist to cock back anyhow. What's the price? The bumper plates, their price per plate. So it's I'm being asked here if the bumper plates are priced as a set or individually they're priced per plate. Um, this guy here ordered a pair of the Jordan Boxer squat shoes instead of 30 pound PR in them, so that's pretty cool. Um, question, my left inner height inner thigh hurts on my last two or three sets, usually the heaviest one. Is there, is this a specific muscle? Is there a certain exercise that I can do to correct this? If you're only hurting on one side or the other and it's not both, then you're probably looking at some type of imbalance issue. Either you're pushing off one leg harder than the other. When you're dealing with a, what it sounds like here, a groin type of issue, it can, be, it can be so many different things. It can be IT band, it can be lower back, it can be abdominal, it can be, God, it can be about anything. Um, so my advice is to start, you know, using a, um, like a monster stick or a lacrosse ball, something to start rolling, a foam roller, something to start rolling to see if you can get any of the scar tissue or any of that muscle to relax up a little bit, see if that has any effect. Um, if it was me personally, I've, I've dealt with a lot of groin issues, and the groin issues are probably the most, uh, how do I want to say this, the, the, one of the worst injuries to deal with because they take so freaking long to recover. Um, groin and hamstring, they, just, they suck. Um, so it's going to take time. It's going to be a workaround. It depends upon how bad the groin issue really is. Um, I can personally get around some of them just by wrapping it with a knee wrap and that compression enough or compression alone is enough to help it. Um, just it's, it's a masking agent. It's not going to help fix it, you know, to help fix it. Usually in this case, you know, skipping one squat workout may make a huge difference. The other thing is to look at different types of, you know, massage therapy, active release therapy, you know, any, any of those type of things to see if any of that will help, it, it could also be, you know, an imbalance, like I said. So without muscle testing, it's really hard to tell. If you can find somebody who's acute in muscle testing, they would be able to help to determine that as well. Um, a lot of these rehab questions are actually better asked to uh, Dr. Ryan Smith or um, Mike Robertson or Tom Diebel on the site. All I can really give you is how I've dealt with these injuries personally myself throughout the years. Personally for the groin issues, all I've ever done is just wrapped them up until it went away. But in many cases that could be nine months to a year, so it takes a long time. Uh, how do you become a sponsored lifter of your company? Uh, <laughs> don't be a dipshit. Um, we have a sponsorship process, an application process. Currently, we are not looking for new sponsors at this time. Um, some things that we look for is you need to be a pro at what you're doing. So we're, if it's a power lifter, we want you to have a pro total before you come in. 
Um, we want you to have a to represent the same type of values that we represent as a company, and it's a, it's a long streamlined process. I'm not going to go into what that process is because a lot of it is you know privileged and confidential as well. So a lot of people do think that it all comes down to who you know. Sometimes that does help. It does have an influencing factor. We do have one stage in the interview process to where our current sponsors can either veto or basically they can veto anybody that we're running through the process with no questions asked. So in a lot of times it is a lot of our sponsors who will recommend people that go through the process. Um, very, very few people we have on the site right now just kind of got in just based upon who they knew and if that person that they knew was probably me. So that's kind of how they got in that way. So there's, there's a lot of people that we have right now who are on the verge of having a pro total that we're kind of waiting for before we can put them on. You know, we also get a lot of applications and a lot of entrants from coaches as well who aren't necessarily lifters. Um, in that regard, we want coaches that, that know what the hell they're doing that have been around for a very long time that have coached people better than what they are, that have actually done it themselves and, you know, can represent the company and the brand the way that it's supposed to. So um, I don't want a bunch of fakes and frauds and, you know, affiliate junkies on the site. So um, we're very particular in regards to how that process works. When we do look for sponsors, we will make a post on Facebook and on the site that we're accepting sponsorship applications, and then we will put up a email address for you to email those to, which goes directly to everybody that's a part of the sponsorship committee. Can I go and talk about the idea of helping others in the gym and passing on what, lear what one learns? There's something very special and honorable about this um, and unselfish to boot. Um, something many in our people can see. Um, yeah, you know, I think that it's it's the older lifters and the, the more experienced lifters' responsibility to pass on what they know to the younger lifters because for a lot of us who have been around for a while, it was the older lifters that got us into this to begin with. So it is giving back and passing on and so forth. So... You know, I, I don't really want to harp on this because my whole company is kind of founded on this whole concept and all the educational aspects of the site are founded on this concept as well. Do I think it's important? Yeah, I think it's extremely important. I think it's, you know, it's part of the responsibility of being, you know, a, a pro lifter, a good lifter, an elite lifter, an elite bodybuilder, or just somebody who's been training for 20 years. You got to keep in mind that, you know, most of the people who are out there training, even the hardcore people aren't going to last longer than three to five years. So it's, it's a very, very few, a very small population of people who have been training hard for more than 10 years. So what we, what we need to do is to get those people who are training hard now and try to keep them training hard for 10 years so they can keep this, you know, philosophy that training hard and competitive strength sports building over the years. You know, everybody seems to think that I talk to that, you know, every power lifter that enters a meet is going to power lift for 10 years, and that's not the case. I would say the vast majority of them are going to lift in one meet, be gone, and then within two years never lift again. You know, it's just kind of how it works. It's, you know, everybody's looking for the easy way out. This, this, these sports are not the easy way out. These sports are about longevity, busting your balls, and being patient and dealing with the adversity that it takes to get to the level to get to your highest level or your highest potential. A lot of people don't have the desire or the will or the dedication to do that. <laughs> 